begin this morning by uh, a, a little story that almost everybody here, I'm sure, will be able to identify with. Okay, it's called uh, the job that nobody did. Uh, I've used it before in various places, so it's not anything new. And no, I didn't invent it. Do I have maybe tweaked it a little bit? Once upon a time, there were four men named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done. Everybody was asked to do it. But everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about it because it was everybody's job. <coughs> everybody thought that anybody could do it. And nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody and nobody did the job that anybody could have done in the first place. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I think we've all been in situations and perhaps we have been part of the anybody, somebody, nobody, or everybody portion uh, as, it, as it turns out. But uh, we realize that oftentimes inactivity uh, becomes a real issue. I remember about 15 years ago, there was a radio talk show that was based somewhere in Florida that uh, did an hour and a half call-in program on apathy. Okay. The discussion was apathy. Nobody phoned in. <laughs> What's that one? So that kind of defines the whole thing right there, doesn't it? it? It really does. So today we turn once again to our passage in Ephesians chapter 4 that we have been going through, I trust, in a beneficial fashion uh, as we have looked at God's focus for the local church, especially the local church. Uh, I'm a local pastor. Uh, this is the group that God has blessed me uh, with being able to minister within and for. And I think that when we are looking at this kind of a passage, uh, we can see that, yes, there is a church universal uh, down through 2,000 years. There is the church that is currently in existence in its physicality. Uh, throughout the world or the nation or the state, the county, the upper country, but in our case, the applicability is certainly only, or I should say perhaps primarily to us. How do we see ourselves fitting within this? Uh, we understand that God had a very special place for the church, the bride of Christ, Okay, it is being called out, the ecclesia, the, the called out ones on this side of the cross, this side of Pentecost, uh, technically, to be a specific group that is going to be the bride of his son throughout eternity. And he has some seriously focused desires for the makeup of this bride. Okay, For those of us, I'm, I'm thinking here, you know, of those of you sitting out there with unmarried daughters, uh, those of you that are fathers, I went through this with all three of my girls, you know, trying to envision uh, what type of man would be the appropriate one for a mate for each one of those girls. Okay? Uh, they all fooled me, of course. You know, that's the way, you know, girls do, you know, and that whole marriage, love, romance thing and everything that goes with it, which is, I guess, part of the fun. It's also why fathers turn gray and, and go bald because, you know, it's, uh, but you get the idea that each of us, humanly speaking, you know, has a certain standard we would like to see when it comes to choosing a bride for our sons or a groom for our daughters, God is in a similar situation, but of course being omni-everything, including being able to see the present, the past, and the future in one picture, so to speak, he has some distinctive capabilities that human dads don't have. Uh, so. When he brought this passage into being and put it on the 
in the heart and pen of the Apostle Paul to write to the Ephesian Christians in that first century church. He said, this is what I want for, this is the goal, this is the format, this is the program, though we often misuse that term in the spiritual realm. This is what I, my desire is for the church, the local church to strive for. He said, I want it to see itself as a special entity. And chapter five goes into that in detail that we haven't even hardly referred to. But here in chapter four, he talks about the gifting that he is providing for the development of the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teaching shepherds. And then he gives a reason for this gifting, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And then he gives a duration. How long is this all supposed to go on? Well, until we all come in the unity of the faith and to the measure of the stature of Christ. Well, isn't all of a sudden we think, whoa, we're in over our head here. You know, this playing church on a surface level is one thing, but diving into it like this, we could drown in a passage like this. Okay. Verse 14 talks about the danger of the opposition. Satan and the spiritual forces in the darkness of the spiritual realm are going to oppose God's plan. That's nothing new. Satan's always actively in opposition to the things of God. Okay. And he's going to bring deceit and, and manipulate doctrines and all kinds of stuff. And people are going to be deceived by the craftiness of these things, everything that goes with it. And then verse 15 talked about the centricity of Christ that we covered last Lord's Day. That Christ central, because it's really unfortunate, but also a subtle thing that we can wind up doing good things and pouring zeal, effort, time, you know, intellect, money, you name it, into stuff that isn't Christ-centered. Think about it. How many programs do you know that are good programs in and of themselves that churches jump into, you know, that really you had a hard time finding Jesus anywhere in there, at least the biblical Jesus. We need to be cautious because if we're not Christ-centered, we become a religious group instead of a Christian group. So as we come to verse 16, we find the following, from whom, speaking of Christ, that comes right from verse 15, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, makes increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. At which point, many of us, if you read it for the first five or ten times, say, say what? What does all that gobbledygook mean? Okay. Well, we're going to kind of, I'm going to try to break it down for our consideration here this morning. But note to begin with what we're talking about, from whom that Christ-centered, Christ as the head of the body that we spoke of uh, last week, in the book of Colossians in chapter 1, it tells us in verses 18 and 19, he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all he might have the preeminence, for it pleased God the Father that in Christ should all fullness dwell. Uh, that's the essence of this Christ central, Christ centricity. Christocentric is the theological term, but don't bore yourselves with that. Uh, what we're talking about here is when we talk about what are now we supposed, how are we supposed to bring a wrap-up statement to our responsibility as believers inside of the church? What are we, where are we supposed to go with this stuff about? you know, gifted men and equipping of the saints and, and you know, hanging in there and being durable and the unity of the faith and doctrinal knowledge and the awareness of false teaching uh, and the manipulation of satanic forces. 
uh, and that we have a responsibility to speak the truth in love, everything that goes with it. And then what, but what, okay, but now what? How do you, how do you tie it off? God gives us verse 16. And there are two parts to verse 16. And for want of labels, I'm just going to give you a couple. It's not in scripture, okay? It's not inspired by God. I'm going to give you labels of what I see as, as two parts for our consideration. The first part is action. What action are we to take? And then the second part is what is the product that that action should result in? In other words, just being busy may not necessarily be everything that we could, should consider. Being busy might produce things that aren't really pleasing to God. How do we know? Well, we'll take a look at that when we come to it. The emphasis, I think, that you look at in verse 16 is from whom the whole body, and then you have all kinds of words, but I'm just going to jump through and give you some of these these whole body joined together he says each part every joint every part of itself you have just a lot of each every and holes that are going on there. okay uh, in other words god here gets pretty specific when he talks about who inside the church should be involved in the church and he says each part Every part, the whole body, you know, each joint supply. This is not a spectator sport. One of the things that really can inhibit the life of a church is this thing right here, the pulpit. Okay? <laughs> because you guys can see yourselves as spectators in the bleachers watching a dancing monkey juggling juggling fish bowls or whatever that is not what church is designed to be each part participating okay i we understand because god gave gifted men to do their responsibility but their responsibility is not the sole purpose of the church it is just one functioning part important yes but it is just one of the functioning parts. Fitly joined together, action words. Fitly joined together. That is just one word in the Greek language. Uh, it's three in the, in the English, but it talks about building. It, and it talks more than that. It talks about being connected with close joints. Okay? Now, those of you that have done especially masonry work, and have fit things together so that they are seamless. Isn't that, those of you that sew, isn't that the idea that nobody can see the seams when you're done? You know, or something, I don't know, something like that. Uh, but when Emily and I were in <laughs> Jerusalem, they have in, un, underneath what you see in all the pictures, over there underneath in the subterranean 40 and 50 feet underneath the earth level or ground level you have the original foundation walls of the wall around jerusalem okay? that one stone is estimated at being 55 tons okay it is long big and deep and you know they just didn't pick that thing up and toss it into place but you look at it and you have a hard time finding any place that you can stick a pencil with in the crack in the joint okay. uh, we might consider them unsophisticated when it comes to technological expertise uh, but you start looking at the seven wonders of the ancient world and you will find such things that are jointed together so precisely that it just boggles the mind that even with today's stuff, I mean, you see some things, especially those of you that understand a little bit about CNC machines, that they can be so precise with their laser cut and control that the joints are almost 
unrecognizable. That's the picture that is here, fitly joined together. That doesn't sound, just initially, it doesn't sound like what we should have here is 70 or 80 Lone Rangers. Forget Tonto. We don't have a bunch of Batmans out there all doing their singular heroic thing. There's not one and only one Superman who is flying the world, doing good, any of this other stuff inside the church. We're talking about the whole body joined together so that through this joining, we take action to produce a product. So it's not Lone Wolf, I do my own thing. That's not what the church is designed to be. So we'll develop this a little bit as we go. Compacted, it talks about here in the verse. I'm using the King James words. You'll have to figure out which word is what if you've got a different translation. Compacted by that which every joint supplied. Compacted means it's a similar word to fitly joined together, but it's not identical, has a little bit different emphasis. It means to unite by driving it into place. It's taking that slightly oversized wooden peg in the old style of construction where there wasn't a lot of nails, iron being used, and you bored the hole and the peg was just slightly larger and you drove it into where it would join two intersecting beams. You drove it in so tightly that it was an impossibility to have the building fall apart. That's the picture that is being given here. And you have these repetitious descriptive terms of how the body is to be, is to come together. And it says that which every part supplies. Now, what part of every do we have a problem with? Hmm? Uh, you see the spectator thing that many churches get into. You know, we hire a guy, he's a talking head, he cuts the lawn, turns out the church bulletins, preaches the services, and we throw 20 bucks his way once a month whether he needs it or not. You know, that is not a biblical viewpoint. It's not a, a biblical format. That's not what is being taught here at all. Every part contributing, every, every joint being compacted, every, every, all, that which every contributes. It, uh, Dawn read for us a passage in 1 Corinthians, and I want you to turn back there. I'm not going to go through 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, it's, you know, 12, 13, and 14 are a unit have to deal with spiritual gifting uh, and so forth. But he read the point that gave the illustration. The church is not a 40-foot eyeball sitting out in the parking lot, hoping somehow that somebody's going to come by and get that piece of gunk out of his eye because he has no fingers. And if he wants to be moved over into the shade, that 40-foot eyeball, if we're all a gorgeous blue, baby blue eyeball, they're going to have a problem because we got some feet. And we need feet in order to move. And if there's an itch, we don't have fingers to scratch it. We don't even have an eyelid. And the eye thinks it's pretty hot stuff, you know, going on blinking at all the boys, you know, and everything <laughs> that goes with it. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. But if you don't have an eyelid, you can have some real serious problems the next time you're in a dust storm. Go ahead, go out and jump out on the tractor and head out across the field. You'll see what I mean, you yeah. If you want a good, just wear contacts. You'll, you'll get the idea. Yeah, it, uh, okay. So that body analogy here, and God designed it so that it's not even the, the good-looking stuff that really often should be recognized as the important stuff. Okay? There are times, you know, like, you know, yeah, the human body, we really dote on the outside, don't we? I mean, we got the hair and the neck and the eyes and the legs and, you know, you name it, you know, whatever part happens to be your favorite part. 
How many of you have a favorite part is like the liver? <laughs> I'll bet nobody here thought the liver as when I said favorite body part, did you? Try functioning without a liver. Hmm? There's a lot of pieces. You can lose fingers. You can lose a hand. You can lose an arm or a leg. You can lose a lot of chunks. You can lose a lung or a kidney. Uh, you can lose a lot of stuff, but there are some extremely important body parts you can't afford to lose those. And they're usually, almost universally, ugly. Okay? If you flop the liver out there on the table, uh, not too many people would do anything except go, yeah! Uh, right. They are not, but important, important to the point of essential because the body won't function without some of that stuff. That's the analogy that Paul is using here in chapter 12 in this body. Pretty common analogy. Okay. Now, it, uh, in verse 1, it takes off and does this in chapter 12. I'm going to go back and do the first few verses. Concerning spiritualities, the word and gifts in the, in the King James is an italic. It's not there. It just means spirituality. I would not have you ignorant. He writes that because they were ignorant, of course. You know that you were Gentiles, always carried away by non-speaking, dumb idols. Talking about the fact that idol, idolatry, uh, idols themselves are deaf, dumb, and blind. Even as you were led, wherefore I give you to understand, no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus a curse. Apparently that was going on. And they were claiming to be Christian at the same time. And that no man can say Christ is, is the Lord except through the Holy Spirit. Now, having established that, Paul writes it. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, capital S, talking about the Holy Spirit. There are differences or diversities of administrations or rulings, but the same Lord, capital L for Lord, talking about Jesus as Lord. Verse 6, there are diversities of operations. The word is energeo. That means the ener that's the fuel in the tank that makes it run. Okay? There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, capital G, that's God the Father, which works all in all. So you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit all involved in this gifting, in this diversity of gifting that is being given to the local church. But the manifestation or the visible declaration, I'll put it that way, of the Spirit, because he is the one who is the initiator of the gifting, is given to just the pastor and the rest of you are a bunch of dumb rocks. <laughs> I hope your Bible doesn't say anything like that. Okay? He says the same, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man so that the body profits in its totality. King James says to profit with all. In other words, the gifting that you have as a believer has been given you so that you can utilize it for the benefit of the rest of the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah exactly what it said. <coughs> so it goes on, gives a list of the gifting uh, that is available, and I'm not going to get into apostolic gifts, first permanent gifts, and all that stuff. We'll do that another time. But you get the idea of what is going on here. The triune Godhead is all part of the Holy Spirit-enabled gifting process where it's not just the gifted men of Ephesians 4.11, it's the gifted congregation of chapter 4, verse 16, that is all supposed to be contributing, not as spectators in the pews, okay, but as involved in the dynamic of the church and its ministers. That doesn't mean that everybody's a preacher. It doesn't mean that everybody has the gift of mercy or that everybody has the gift of, you know, pick, you know, different. That's not what I was talking about. He's talking about each part supplying that which the other part lacks. Okay? There is an example of a church many years ago now in Sarasota, Florida, 
that had a groundbreaking service for their new facility and instead of the usual shovel little thing you know that as a token groundbreaking thing when they brought the people together somebody remembering the words of Jesus take my yoke upon you they borrowed an old plow a single bottom plow and they borrowed a yoke that went with it and they they picked out their two heftiest guys you know that would probably be Josh and Ron you know and our the other the great big muscular type guys and they hooked them up and they leaned into the traces and the plow didn't even move I don't know if you ever tried to tow one of those old buggers but it takes they call it horsepower for a reason believe it okay didn't even move yeah so they took the building committee over there hooked them up that didn't help either you know they plugged in the Sunday school teachers the Iwana leaders you know the nursery workers you know the elders the deacons the deaconesses still didn't work it wasn't until everybody in the entire church body had grabbed a hold of the tow ropes that they got the plow to move at all great illustration that the whole body fitly joined together is the only way that it's actually going to work the way it's designed to work the effective working notice what effective working is tells you there in chapter 4 verse 16 of Ephesians okay it says that with every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part if each part isn't contributing then the effectiveness of the body is going to be hindered okay and that is an activity this is an operation this is production this is something that is supposed to be producing something and it requires the activity it requires as I mentioned an action that goes with it turn over if you went to the book of James for just a moment Hebrews and then James James chapter 1 the half brother earthly half brother of our Lord uh, was inspired to write this in verse 22 and following be ye doers of the word not hearers only deceiving your own selves for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror he beholds himself then he leaves and straightway forgets what he looks like but whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this man will be blessed in his work doer not just a hearer okay? a participant not just a spectator in the measure it tells us in Ephesians 4 it, it the effectual working in the measure of each and every part okay? God has perhaps a different size of bucket for you to fill than the person next to you okay? God has done that he's given the first Corinthians 12 tells he gives to each man according to his will okay so it's God who dispenses it's our responsibility to be the right piece in the right place. Kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, isn't it? When you think about it, okay? It, uh, can you imagine, I mean, you know, you've, you've all done jigsaw puzzles, you know, that are missing a piece. And regardless of how good the rest of the puzzle looks, it's just not a finished product, is it? Because well, you need that other piece. Now, here's the thing. You see, we you may not have recognized it, but you figure out where did that piece go? That's simple. All the pieces inside the box, in the closet on a dark night, all got together, and they started picking on it. They did. They, did. they got to picking on that one. They, you know, because you had you had the bright gold piece that, where, where the cross went on top of the steeple. You know, and ha, ha, he's not. He's yeah, I'm gonna be part of that. And then you got the cow out there. You know, well, you gotta have cows out there. And you got buildings, you got doorknobs, you got the car, and you got the beautiful, you know, people going in the church and the gorgeous door and the stained glass windows. You know, but over there you got is that a gopher mound? Yeah, you know, and the pieces got the pick and said, you know, you're not contributing anything beautiful. 
you know? So the little tiny piece that had the gopher, the dirt from the gopher mound in it, he jumped out of the box, you know, and he's actually, he's eating pizza in Tucson right now. You got to understand that the picture, when you put it together the next day, is missing a piece, and it connected to four or five other pieces, and you wonder what was in that that piece, because you don't know, you know? That could have been gold bullion. It could have been a gopher mound. It could have been the gopher himself. It might have been the little lost boy that was trying to find his way into the church building. You don't know. But it hooked into other pieces, and it takes away from the, the whole picture because it's not hooked in and connected with everything else. It's supposed to be. Otherwise, the picture isn't complete. You kind of get the idea. So we go from action to product. Product, making increase, the last part of the verse. Making increase of the body. Notice, it doesn't say making increase of your own self-esteem, your own self-worth, or everybody patting you on the back. It says, no, the focus is on the body, okay? Each part contributed. Making increase of the body you know, unto the edifying of itself in love. In John chapter 15, you have a passage that we call the vine and the branches passage. It's not an evangelistic passage. It's a fruit-bearing passage. Jesus was very specific. He said, herein is my Father glorified when you bear much fruit. Okay? The fruit thing is used over and over and over, and it tells us repeatedly in eight short verses that the vine cannot produce the fruit it's designed to unless it has an abiding relationship with the root. The branches simply cannot produce the grapes unless it remains in an abiding relationship with that which provides the energy and the life. Okay? That's what the Christian life is supposed to be. When Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I'm coming that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly, he wasn't just talking about salvation, that's the life part, but that more abundant, that, that's a Greek word for, that's it, got the, uh, the X in front of it, which simply means that it is super abundance. In other words, overflowing. Uh, I don't know about you, but I sometimes struggle with getting a handle on having a super abundant, victorious life. I find myself getting distracted with too many of the cares of this world. Okay. It, uh, uh, Jesus wanted believers to be productive, to bear fruit. In fact, talks about in that analogy of the vine dresser that his father's the husbandman and the actions of a Christian's life that aren't producing fruit, God will whack out. We call it chastening in other places in Scripture. Okay, God will eliminate because every son that the that the Father loves, He scourges. He'll chasten. A lot going into that. What needs to be produced? Lots of money. No. Big fancy buildings. No. And, uh, tremendous programs. No. <laughs> Buses and rolling in and out to fumigate every mosquito in the county. No. And, uh, no, none of those. What is to be produced? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self control. That's what Galatians 5 22 and 3 talk tells us. Okay. Everything else is fine, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A Christocentric ministry is going to be interested in producing fruit that glorifies the Lord who redeemed us. He's not primarily interested in how many programs we got, how many of this, how much of that, or anything else. Uh, he's really interested in 
the character production of your life and does that character reflect God? That's what he's really interested in. He'll take care of everything else. The God who sent his son to die on the cross for you is not going to be stingy when it comes to giving you whatever else you need to live a productive Christian life. But you have to do your part as I have to do mine. What are our lives producing? Are they producing the fruit of the Spirit? Are they producing things that honor God? Good question for each of us to ask ourselves. To the edifying of itself in love. Edifying, building up. It's the same word clear back in verse 12. You know, for the equipping of the saints. Say the work of the ministry for the edifying, the building up. It's a construction term. Okay? Nailing stuff together. Everything that goes with it. The edifying of itself, the building it up. Okay? Uh, wow, in love. In love. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we miss a lot of stuff. We really do. Because we simply don't make the effort to see what God actually says and what he's actually provided. Okay? Much of the church today, universally, suffers and struggles with being the local representation of his grace and his mercy that it has been called to be. Uh, evangelism just outflows from being what we need to be. Uh, it really does. So I come back to, in closing, as we wrap this little series up, we've seen method, plan, action. Uh, today we've seen not only the action, but the product of it. Uh, this passage has pretty much the formula for what God wants the church to be. In contrast to that, I return to the quote that I gave you when we began this series from Mark Twain. That the church is a place where a nice, respectable person stands in front of other nice, respectable people, urges them to be nicer and more respectable. You know, that's somewhere between humorous and totally sad because unfortunately it applies for a lot of local churches and each of our church, we need to be on guard against just doing what's nice and respectable you know, instead of what doing what God wants us to do. As Peter questioned in Acts, do we please God or do we please man? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can do both. But much of our culture, as in any culture for 2,000 years, has been anti-God to the point that you're going to have to see where that thin red line is on the ground, and you're going to have to step over or stay on the side, and one side is godly and the other side is worldly. And, uh, if all a church does is be respectable, then it's leading people down the wrong path because that's not what the Bible says. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of picking out this portion over the last few weeks, opening it up, and I trust in a fashion that touches upon the heart presentation that you desire. Lord, these are things that each of us must examine individually and then corporately as see how do we integrate how do we fit in what are we supposed to be doing we're all gifted we get that at the moment of salvation are, are we allowing your spirit to develop that gifting are we putting it into action are we contributing to the edifying to the building up uh, lord are we loving each other in a fashion that shows because of the demonstration of service, how we are to integrate. Uh, Lord, the rest of the world is going to see, good or bad, our ambassadorship. Let us be good ones in Christ's name. Amen.